Alrighty. So yeah, for those who like walked in during prayers, um, yeah, today's talk will be about the idea of, yeah, making friends with ourselves and what that process somewhat looks like. And I mean, it'll be different for everyone, of course, and everyone finds their own way for what they need to be friends with themselves and um, how that translates to actually, yeah, making friends with all sentient beings. Um, so yeah, to start out, I'd like to actually say a quote from, from Start Where You Are by Pema Chodron. So what Pema says is, uh, we already have everything we need. There is no need for self-improvement. And with that, I would like to thank you all for coming today. I know we actually have some food in the back. Patty, uh, Patty said there's some food, so we have all we need. You know, we're good to go. So, but um, right, you know, we're still here for a reason, right? So, um, but what's really nice about that is pretty much what's, what Pema is saying is like, there's we already have these really lovely basic qualities within ourselves and they're always there and they've always been there. Um, our basic wisdom, you know, our basic compassion, our Buddha nature. So these are things that we always have with us, but often they're just, you know, clouded by all the chaos, you know, that we can find in life, right? Um, things that we generate to hide ourselves um, and hold our hearts tight and closed because things can get pretty painful. Um, but with that, things are also very loving. Um, but with that being said, this path, uh, I guess there's no need for an aggressive approach for endless self-improvement. I think um, often, right, making friends with ourselves or whatever it is or whenever we're working um, with our practice we may take this kind of fix it approach. Well, you know, I'm kind of lacking here. I need more compassion. You know, I'm over here's not looking too good. Like, let me up my wisdom, you know, but <laughs> it's like, uh, and this stuff's important. And it does kind of develop naturally though. There's like a flow to it. There's this healing aspect to it, which is really cool. Um, so I just love that she says that, that, you know, there's nothing really to fix. Um, we're actually, you know, totally chilling in a weird way. Um, just underneath all those clouds that are covering that great blue sky, as the imagery sometimes is. Um, you know, we could always look outside and see that blue sky there. Um, even on cloudy days, you know it's there, which is really cool, even if you don't directly see it. Um, so with that being said, these basic qualities, again, they're always kind of shining through. And kind of part of making friends with yourself is both acknowledging and being gentle towards the darker sides of yourself while also getting in touch with these loving qualities as well and a basic way to start doing that is by using our awareness and this is like you know what we train in like meditation and whatnot our focus our concentration our awareness mindfulness something like a shamatha vipassana meditation is a good way to start and i know we have different groups here that we hold uh, almost every day, I believe. Um, but the reason for this is we need to actually have a little time where we slow down and can start recognizing both these, this wealth and this richness, but also um, maybe our dark sides that we didn't even know were there and they were just kind of operating and we didn't even know they existed. Um, and a major point with that is we'll see these dark sides and the goal isn't actually to get rid of them. And that's, again, tying into it. We have everything we need. There's no need to fix anything. Um, there's no need to push these things away. Um, because by doing so, we're just continuing, actually, the cycle of karma, these habitual processes where we aren't looking at this, um, maybe this painful stuff that has happened. So... With time through meditation, we do. We start to, to develop awareness. And it's really cool because with time, kind of this, this other fun stuff starts coming up, like, you know, curiosity and um, really like gentleness and stuff like that, too. It's really amazing. And that curiosity element is really cool because not only are we, right, we're sitting back a little bit and taking it slow, looking at all these different things, but this curiosity kicks in and I always it kind of warms my heart thinking of it, but it's like, you know, seeing an old friend 
you haven't seen him in a long time, whatever it is, you haven't kept touch. And then you see him again, you're like, wait, I kind of know you a little, you know, I know you, but there's like new things in them too. They've changed over time. And you start seeing that a little bit more as well. And it's really cool. Like, I think there's like these little moments where, at least for myself, where um, I'd kind of surprise myself and be like, whoa, that's kind of cool. I didn't know I could do that or something. Or um, I didn't know I was capable of this or whatever it is. Or, ooh, I didn't know I was carrying that around, you know? So it's really, it's really amazing how that curiosity works. And um, I like to use that curiosity, the word curiosity, because it does, it also carries that playfulness and that loving kind of quality to it, right? being curious is, uh, you know, kids are very curious, They're always looking at all these different things and usually pretty non-judgmentally, you know, in the earlier years. <laughs> um, and they just have fun, you know, they see a butterfly fly by and I forget, I heard this somewhere. It's like, you see the butterfly fly by, no, Sadhguru says it, a butterfly flies by and it's just the kids just totally entranced by it. Wow, a butterfly, you know, but an adult sees a butterfly fly by and it's kind of just like, ah, you know, a little butterfly, I got to go do my dishes or something. <laughs> so yeah, that curiosity and playfulness starts coming back. And I think it's just reconnecting again with that, that richness that we really have and that, that fun that exists within us, that lightness to that spacious quality, because with all of our, you know, hardcore hurts and whatnot, we develop, um, right. Our ignorance, we start hiding, aggression we start pushing things away or we develop greed like we just want things because we don't feel like we're enough when you know we we really are already enough um but with those um they're called the poisons or the kleshas uh, that greed aggression and ignorance uh we start to shut down we start getting really tight and this kind of actually goes against a lot of the the fundamental nature of things which is very spacious and changing and impermanent and floaty. Um, so to begin to experience again that spaciousness and that love and all that, we do have to kind of dive into the fire a little bit um, of our tricky, sticky, and icky side. And to do that, we also have to <laughs> off the cuff, not here, but uh, but. We gotta, we gotta be able to hold our seat, and that's really hard to do. And that's what's great again about med what we're doing in meditation is we're really trying to hold our seat. You know, we're really trying to stick there and stick it out because what our karmic pattern wants to do, it wants to either act out or repress. So one or the other. It's either no, I don't even want to see it, or just acting it out, and it continues that cycle. But when we hold our seat. Again, and again, with that gentleness and the spaciousness in mind, it kind of like loosens things up. It's almost like the karma itself is kind of like, huh? Like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> stop doing that. Like, you know what I mean? And it's really cool because you kind of just start to appreciate it all more, you know, the practice and everything. So, um, but by holding our seat, we are able to kind of wear out the pattern essentially. And that pattern is going to keep coming back since it's it's cyclical. So samsara or suffering is cyclical existence. Basically, we keep doing the same things over and over. But when we hold our seat, we start to go against that pattern. We start to go against our cycles. Um, so when we do that, more space starts to develop where new things are possible. And we no longer have to go down uh, routes that lead us to suffering. Um, another really great thing I think Pema mentioned in her book as well, um, and a great way to practice holding your seat and being able to face some of this more tender stuff is by dropping the storyline. So a very common way that we um, don't get in touch with our darker sides, our poisons, um, is by creating a storyline. Well, this happened because of this, because she said that at one time, and now I'm hurting because of her, or whatever it is, or maybe I'm not meant for this because X, Y, and Z, right? Just beliefs we've been holding for a really, really long time, a very, very long time. And um, 
with these storylines, right, with, you know, kind of it kind of skirts around the core of the issue, which is where there's this kind of it's a soft spot that we all carry. It's a soft spot which can be called bodhicitta, and it's where our compassion is, our want to wake up and benefit others is. And it's a it's scary going there because it is we have to face maybe ways people are getting harmed. Uh, we have to face the way um, people are screwing each other over. We also have to face how scary love can be. You know, we want something to bring us a lot of happiness and it's great, but what if someone passes away? What do we do with that? You know, it's scary. Um, but that's really where that bodhicitta is, is learning how to, yeah, like, I guess be a part of that whole process and enjoy, not really maybe enjoy, but get to know what this experience is so that we can share it with others and we can engage with others in a connecting way, a loving way, a kind way. Um, but again, we have to drop that storyline. You know, if we're still caught on, well, 10 years ago, this happened. It's going to be really, you know, it's going to be harder to, to get to the heart of the matter of, Hey, you know, because 10 years ago, this happened, actually that kind of, you know, that kind of hurt me and I wanted to do things differently, but you know, things didn't work out that way. Um, but yeah, so being able to drop that storyline is super important and we can get to see what's underneath. So Pema kind of describes it like this, like what's underneath that storyline? So here's like the thing, you know, it's like going on, going on, but what's underneath it? Cause there's this like thing there, the thing that's there. And you can't, I don't really know exactly how to describe it to be completely honest, but you know, with practice and stuff. And again, I feel like the Buddhist path or path of meditation is kind of the process of making friends with yourself in general and working with a teacher. So that happens very naturally, but there's this kind of thing there um that you feel and only you will kind of really feel it and know it i mean everyone has it right but you have to experience it for yourself kind of thing um but once it's acknowledged and awareness is brought on it there's just a lot of benefits that come again that playfulness joy all the all the lovely things that we can offer the world and start sharing um and with that um i should also mention this part where not only are we right dealing with these poisons, these storylines, but if we also take a moment to reflect that every sentient being is actually experiencing them as well. Um, you know, besides maybe highly enlightened beings. Um, but everyone is, and that's actually pretty momentous to think about. Um, and as we get more in touch with our own selves, get to know ourselves better, it's actually kind of surprising that we're even all still here. <laughs> I was like, it's kind of wild, like with how much stuff we carry and how many ways we beat ourselves up and beat others up. Um, Lama basically, when I was talking to him about this talk, he was like, yeah, we're all kind of just beating on ourselves and beating on others. And it's very true. And it's pretty immense to see that. Um, and it's also super impressive and just really heartwarming. Just like, wow, we're all still here. We're all still getting together like this. We all go see our families, whatever it is. And it's impressive. And that's even a feat in itself that really just shows how capable we all are and just how worthy we all are of sharing sharing our lives and our experience with each other because um, we've been through a lot. So I think that's a, yeah, it's really nice to kind of reflect on that as well. Um, See how we do on time, 35. Cool. I'll try to wrap up the next bit here in about 10 minutes. So this is um this is kind of like a good, you know, more, I guess, pure dharma type section of the talk here. I'm going to talk about the Lodong mind trainings. Um these are trainings that specifically work with obstacles as turning obstacles into the path of awakening. Um and again, turning pain into the path to awakening. So Lojong Mind Trainings use different slogans. We actually have one in the uh, kind of like a tapestry in the hall, which is really cool to check out sometimes, just read a couple. But the slogan I'll be working with today is um, three objects, three poisons, and three roots of virtue. So I like, I've just been calling the three threes because it's kind of a fun way to say it. But 
again, this brings us back to not only the three poisons of attachment, aversion, and ignorance, aka greed, aggression, and um, ignorance, again. Sorry, just a moment. I think I had a little bit better one here. There we go. Um, but it also includes the three objects that are associated with these, or maybe vice versa, right? Three objects that bring up these three poisons. And the three objects we can simply define as like or friend, uh, dislike or enemy, and then again, just plain old, good old fashioned ignorance or denial. Um, actually, my bad. Um, the third point is neutral. The third object is neutral. Right, so you got like, dislike, and then a neutral object. So because we can rigidly define things into one of these three objects, um, then it kind of, first of all, limit, limits our ability to see very clearly because we're just kind of cutting things up into here, there, and the other. But also we start enacting our three poisons based off of the things we like, dislike, or don't really care, you know, could, couldn't care less about. So things we like, we're going to start feeling attached to. That's that poison of attachment. So like, we start to attach to it. We want to find it and keep it as some external source of happiness, and we want to hold on to it, and it's ours. Um, something we dislike, there's going to be more aversion there. We don't want, we don't want it near us. You know, we want to be at peace. We want to be happy. We don't want that thing nearby. And a lot of times this means aggression as well. Aggression is a form of that aversion or boredom or these things that take us um, out of the moment and away from what's happening. And then things we're neutral about, you know, kind of couldn't care less. Like, we're not even going to really bother checking them out. Um, Pema actually describes ignorance as denial, which I think is really cool, too. Um, in a weird way, we're kind of actively denying certain things about ourselves. It's like we know it in the back of our mind, but we're not ready to accept it. And that's just how it kind of how it goes. And, um, you know, so in a way, we are denying things and we're staying ignorant. So now that we've kind of defined, and it is good to have things somewhat defined, right, so we can work with them, but now that we have these three objects defined and these three poisons defined, we can actually use them to also turn them into three roots of virtue. And this is part of that touching that, that thing, you know, whatever it is there underneath the storyline, that's kind of what we're getting at. Those are essentially how you start finding those three seeds of virtue, um, which are non-attachment, or like generosity, uh, non-aversion, or loving kindness, and then um, wisdom, or like clarity, right? So these things kind of, and there's different interpretations of each, right? But they're these good qualities, you would say. Um, so to actually train with these, um, Chogyam Trimpa uh, talked a lot about this, is first you have to recognize, right, my poison is attaching to an object. So I'm feeling angry about at this person because X, Y, and Z, right? But now you're attributing your anger outside of yourself. It's on that person now. So the first step is to actually say, no, 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 it's not out there. That's not the problem. She's, she or he is not the problem, okay? So you basically remove the object. And now you really, that's where that holding your seat comes in because now there's just that anger, that aggression, whatever it is. And it's just kind of, oh, uh, what's it going to do? What's it going to do? But as you sit with it, and again, just relax and breathe into it, feel it, ask the aggression or whatever it is, how it's doing, how's your day going? And it might fight back a little bit too. <laughs> you just got to sit it out, you know, and roll with it. But as you do that and you start to feel it, hold space for it, it kind of just starts melting. It starts melting. And, the, and there's this weird logic switch, right? Because you, we're saying, I'm going to take away the object so I can hold the aggression myself. But once we do that, everything goes on its head. Because all of a sudden, there's nowhere for it to go. What's it going to latch on to? Aggression takes me trying to push you away to even happen in the first place. So once that object is removed, all of a sudden, it's just kind of, it almost doesn't, I feel like it doesn't even know what to do anymore. <laughs> like the poison doesn't even know what to do anymore. And it just kind of like gives up in a way. And then when that happens, just right, new ways of being arise, such as loving kindness, saying, hey, you know, I actually can sit here with this person, say hi to them. <laughs> so 
Um, so that's essentially how, yeah, we'd be working with these three poisons and we really don't want to push them away. They're not there to, um, right. They kind of just happen to be that way through causes and conditions and delusion and ignorance. Um, but they're in a weird way trying to keep us safe, you know? So you could also see them again, like that old friend, like, Hey, you're doing that thing again. I see you're trying to keep me from experiencing this full life. I get it. It's scary, but I want to, um, I want to keep moving forward here. And I want to, I want to see you in your entirety and include you in the experience as well. Come on in, you know? And again, by doing that, yeah, we're not acting things out or whatever. We're just, we're just generally sitting with it. Um, so why do all this in the first place? Okay. Why do it all in the first place? Well, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's weird because I feel like I still don't exactly know. I don't have a concrete answer, but essentially life just gets much more vibrant and connection with others is just, it just flows. And I don't know, it's, it's a great thing, I guess. Um, I don't know we all deserve to to have good lives and to get to know each other and all this other great stuff. So I guess that's why, I mean, well, no, I mean, I guess I do know the reason why, right? So we don't have big wars. <laughs> so we don't have what's going on in Gaza. Um, so we have more of what's going on here, you know, or what's going on, um, I don't know, what's the other, another good place? There's a lot of good spaces, you know, nice little clubs and stuff or different things, um, right? But I think that's the reason why. So we can have community that cares about, its members and supports its members so that we all can be a part of this big experience of this great life of the world and we can take care of each other you know we don't have to actually cause harm or we don't have to claim things as ours you know exclusively um but we can share and we can give and we can be there for others and i think that's really why this is such an important process because we start to see how others are also kind of in the same boat and how they're also doing really awesome things too. Um, you know, hopefully maybe some people are really roughed up, but even then we got to hold that compassion for them. Um, so at the end of the day, yeah, I think this whole process of making friends with ourselves of getting to know, um, to notice the three objects and then, you know, the three poisons that arise from it to getting to know all of that is a, um, is an amazing experience too. It's just an amazing experience seeing seeing it all occur. So yeah, with that, uh, I think uh, yeah, I'll close out my talk for today. Um, and then yeah, I would love any questions, critiques, comments, uh, criticisms. I don't know. Uh, applause. I'm just having another scene. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> but, Daniel. Thank you, Elias. I really appreciated that. In particular, I thought that the the admonition to hold our seat was um was helpful. I hadn't actually thought about it like that before, and it helped me to relate my seated meditation training to daily practice. Cool. You know? So that was really helpful. Thank you. Um also um I was curious if you had any advice about um, encouraging playfulness and curiosity when a lot of times when people show up um, and maybe along the way, yeah. all of a sudden, it seems like really, really serious, right? It's mm -hmm. really tight and it's like really important because I've got a lot of anxiety or I got problems I need to fix or my life is a mess or people hate me or whatever this story mm -hmm. is. And it feels very, very serious and something has to be done about it. Mm -hmm. um, but there, it's missing that that playfulness. It's missing that curiosity, uh, that sort of openness. And mm -hmm. what would you say, like what kind of advice might you offer to somebody who is in that state to encourage a little bit more curiosity, a little bit more of a playful attitude towards it rather than being so tight about it? Totally. Yeah, that's a super great question. And uh, actually, I think I meant to include that somewhere in here. But um what I was reading as well in the books, it um, seems to recommend, like, right, plain and simple way, do something new. You know, in the back of your mind, if you knew, if there's something you want, you've wanted to try and you kind of never got around to it, do it. Go out and do it if possible. Um, you know, if money allows, whatever it is, or find a free way to do something. <laughs> but it's just spicing things up, freshening things up. 
and it kind of shakes it shakes it up a little so sometimes right it can be hard to just sit and you know be in that level of tightness and find your way through it all so sometimes it takes that a bigger more gross kind of action or event to to loosen things up so i definitely think yeah trying something new even if it's maybe something you've never even really thought of before just getting kind of creative with it which can be hard in that space but um you know fake it till you make it a little bit kind of get through and yeah yeah and then breathe <laughs> yeah, deep belly breaths. <laughs> yeah. So I think that, yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Thanks, Eli. That was really, really excellent talk. Thank you. You know, I'm just so reminded of um you brought in your talk brought in so many other qualities of this path that underlie or accompany what you were talking about. I mean, when you were talking about holding your seat, you know, there's the 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 parameters, the perfections of discipline and patience, 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 right? And generosity towards yourself and generosity towards everybody else around you. So just how training is so encompassing of so many things, you know, it's just, um, I was just reminded of how interconnected all of these teachings are and um, how really we can each learn so much from each other if we just open up and drop those freaking storylines and listen, right? And we can learn so much from you and from, you know, Daniel and from everybody else here if we just have the openness to do it. So I, I really, really appreciate your talk. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. On my home. Thank you. Oh, Zima, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please unmute yourself and begin your question. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Oh, uh, one Maybe second, Zima. It's my bad. It's my bad. I need to try We're going to get the Zoom in house audio up. Can you hear me? Now we can. Now we can. Come Thank you. Okay. I thought it was really hilarious. Your talk it was really quite good. I, uh, I've really been struggling with an awful problem. And I solved part of it this morning. When you started talking, it just sort of made me laugh out loud. And I'll just make a comment. Um, some friends gave me a very nice gift for my birthday. It was a Xbox. And it's attached to my Microsoft account. And I couldn't sign in and I wanted to play a sim game where you drive trains and it made me hysterical. I got so pissed. I went outside and gardened and I don't like gardening. I chopped everything down. I fertilized everything. It made it, it and I came in and I yelled at my mother, poor woman, and she said, it's the Xbox, isn't it? That's <laughs> okay. so, so I decided I would sit back and I wouldn't deal with the Xbox for a while. But I really wanted to play my game. And it was really attached to the fact that Microsoft has been blocking me for years from changing my password. And I have not been able to sleep because I'm so <laughs> angry. And this morning I had the worst meditation I've ever had. Just like hell, hell, dogs, demons, everything just came out in my, uh, at Microsoft and my inability to solve the problem. And then I thought, well, I might ask for help, but then I thought some of that might spill over on somebody and I really don't want to get engaged with anybody when I'm so angry. So halfway through the meditation, I just said, oh, this has to go away. This is stupid. 
And um, I thought, well, why don't I just love Microsoft and love my <laughs> Xbox? And I know it sounds stupid, but it sort of shifted the energy so that I was able to bring myself to look at my old file of Microsoft stuff. And I found a link that allowed me to change my password. So I, be I believe I'll be able to play my game this afternoon. I know this sounds stupid, but it really was a thing. And uh, I want to really acknowledge your uh, talk because it really was describing the thing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's funny how the, sometimes those little little things like that, you know, really can fire us up. It's, yeah, it's a trip. Yeah. But I think we can all agree that Microsoft is probably some sometimes. Yeah, no, it's that's tech is frustrating. Period. If you need help, Zima, I'm always here to help you through that. I've had to deal with Microsoft quite a few times, so like I can get your Xbox set up. Who's who's saying that? I can't see who it is who's saying that. <laughs> it's it's Dylan. Oh, tech Dima. wizard of the song. Oh, okay, if you um. If I can't get into my Xbox, I might contact you. <laughs> yeah, just send send me a call. Okay. Even right. if you're frustrated too, you know, we'll, we'll be there for you. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> I I've I'm an Apple boy, so I I deal with Microsoft frustrations all the time. Uh, but I do have an interesting question. Okay. So when it comes to making friends with yourself, uh, how often do you find yourself like sitting down to just try to rewrite inner narratives like, is that like a daily practice weekly practice do you even try to rewrite your inner narratives and if so what does that mean to you yeah yeah it's actually really cool because um in this uh, i was in a master's of social work program right i still am sort of <laughs> but in that program i started learning about yeah the narrative therapy and whatnot um and then it actually seems like that has been really coming up in Sangha a lot too. Like, how are we going to change these narratives? So it's really cool how all this stuff kind of starts coming together. But yes, yeah, definitely spend time to do that. Uh, and I think it's really important. Um, both, right, our meditation um, of quieting the mind and whatnot and calm abiding, but also, and I know Rama says this too, almost have like little therapy sessions with yourself before you sit or something like that. Just um, that more practical Western psychology approach where you do take that time to rewrite a narrative, right? Where am I at today? What's going on? Um, even just a few minutes before, you know, the formal sit, the formal meditation, I think is really good. And I can't say I always do it, right? <laughs> sometimes I skip out, sometimes I, you know, just go straight in or something. But I do find it really helps, you know, because some mornings you kind of wake up, I kind of wake up and it's just like something's a little off, you know, don't know what it is. But then sitting down and getting in touch with it is really helpful. And then, hey, what's a, another outlook I could take on this or whatever it is? Um, so, yeah, I think narratives are really powerful. And it almost, you know, just like a lot of things, they're very interconnected and they're super sprawling. Um, so it's just, um, yeah, it's interesting to take a look at them and see what narratives that we hold. Because sometimes, right? through ignorance and whatnot, we might not even know that they're there until we start sitting with them. So uh, yeah, I think it's a really, really important as well. Yeah. Um, did that answer the question? I feel like, but yeah, I'd, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh. I, I, I am really slacking on the job. Maybe Zima, I shouldn't come help you today. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your talk, Eli. Yeah. I just wanted to know if you would share a little bit about the benefits you've experienced personally for mm -hmm. making friends with yourself. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, yeah, it's been huge, honestly, really, really huge. So we're just where are you gonna start? I'll try to be quick with it. But I mean, that's kind of been probably my whole journey ever since I started coming here. Um, I used to have just a lot of um, yeah, a lot of self-aggression. And also, yeah, a lot of aggression towards others. It was very passive, you know? Um, so that was a major thing that was, it was very hard. It was it hurt to carry that stuff, right? And I mean, it's, it's still there, you know, don't get me wrong. It's just, it's 
dwindled so much. So that's something that really shows it's just a lot more lightness and lovingness. Like it feels a lot easier to like, even just make an eye contact, like, what's up? You know, like it's so much easier now. Like I used to like always dart around, like it was just so uncomfortable to have any sort of connection like that. Um, but nowadays, man, I really, I feel warmth from it. You know, it feels good. It feels like I'd let, you know, there's like a, I'm leaning out a little bit more and reaching more and it's really awesome. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of like more playful, yeah, that playfulness stuff too, just, um, less rigidity, um, as well, just a lot of playfulness and less rigidity. And I think that's just a result again, as a practice as a whole, like what Susan was playing is er saying is everything is so connected. Um, then finally, um, being able to, to kind of like be with yourself you know, be okay. Now that's probably been the biggest thing for me. And, uh, and it's really cool. Yeah. I'm so grateful. You know, I uh, probably, would, you know, yeah. Just being able to like, actually just kind of sit here and be okay. So it's, it's really cool. And I'm like, um, even when making a mistake or something or doing something wrong, it's a lot easier now to just be like, Oh, like that, there's that, you know, it's just, there it is. Um, you know, I don't have to go that way anymore or whatever it is. So, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? No. Thank you. You sure? All right. Let's nice. begin with dedication then. Cool. Or end with dedication. Take it away. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Okay. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may what which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. Our powerful Chen Rizing Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song. Magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avla Kateshvara, may treasure of an obstacleless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Adrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa. Crown jewel of the snowy land sages, low song drakpa, may rest at your holy feet. Okay, yeah. Oh man, I forgot. Tricky, no, that's not that. Yeah, sweet. Thank you. Yeah, that one like little kind of just came up just then. That was cool. <laughs> But Pema Chodan also kind of wrote like writes like that. So I was definitely inspired by her because she'll be all the she goes, the hardcore heavy stuff, you know? Like it's just like I don't know what you call that, that word phrase, but yeah, she's good. But um yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Do we have any announcements? Are there any yeah. announcements? announcements? Yes. So uh today there's a men's group at 12 30. And um I don't see Andrew, but I, I think there's some of the men that Join and maybe they've got it worked out. Or uh, oh, Bill is leading. Oh, fantastic! So there um, is that. It's the Dharma dudes, and uh, and then the other announcement uh, is that on February fourth we're having a, cel a celebration of uh, Losar. It's the Tibetan New Year with a refuge ceremony, and also an entering the path ceremony. So uh, that's a very special day, and I hope and Lama Jimpa will be here, and I ho hope to see many of you here. 
So I'm gonna make sure there's any, Susan, do you have any announcement or anything or no? Okay, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Eli, excellent. Oh, my God.